Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to this episode of AP World History with your host, Mr. Ancharsky. I try so much, and yet I fail. Uh, well, anyway, welcome to AP World History with Mr. Ancharsky. Today, we're going to finish up Unit 6. We're going to look at Chapter 6. We'll talk about some social, economic, scientific and artistic developments by the end of the 19th century, by the end of the 1800s. So your bell work is on the screen right now. You should have six from this unit. What are some ways industrialization is changing Africa, Europe, Asia, and the Americas? So today we're going to focus on scientific, social, and artistic changes by the end of the 1800s. We'll look at some developments of modern society leading us into World War I. But first things first, the lesson objectives. Threefold, I know, I'm sorry, but it's important. The lesson objectives are explain how environmental, meaning social and natural factors, contributed to varied patterns of migration between 1750 and 1900. And then also explain economic factors and how they contributed to migration in that time period. And then finally, explain how and why new patterns of migration impacted society between 1750 and 1900. But before we even get started, I really want to define what we mean by the Gilded Age. So the Gilded Age oftentimes refers to the late 19th century, up until World War I, 1914. And the Gilded Age is so called because on the surface, Europe and Western society is progressing ever towards a glorious future. Technological advancements will be made. We will see massive amounts of wealth being generated. And yet, at the same time, underneath that gleam, underneath that progress, we still have a society that is largely poor. We have immense amounts of urban poverty. And we have this overall feeling of pessimism in world society. So on the surface, things are looking pretty wonderful. Gilded means a gold covering. So a gold covering over a cheap metal. So the Gilded Age, extreme wealth inequality, but at the same time, technological advances. So first we'll look at some scientific and technological advances. We'll then take a gander at philosophy as well. So really, the late 19th century is the second industrial revolution, meaning this is going to be another phase of the so-called industrial revolution. And the industrial revolution in the late 19th century, this second industrial revolution, is basically focused on these three industries. We got steel, we got chemicals, we got electricity. Really, the way to remember the second industrial revolution is literally industrial revolution part two, electric boogaloo. So before I even delve into these industries, I really want to pay attention to the geopolitical situation of the second industrial revolution. Well, by the second industrial revolution, it's not just the British who dominate the world economy. We have new industrial powerhouses in the United States and in Germany. So the United States, as a result of the end of the Civil War, will see a massive amount of industrialization and prosperity. Germany will become a thing by the 1870s. And the German government will be heavily in favor of sponsoring industrialization. And we'll look more at Germany next unit. But the US and Germany are emerging as industrial powers. They are centers of trade and industry. 
especially these three industries right here. We got steel. Steel is easier to make now. Oh my God, you can use steel for anything, for military technology. You can use steel to build railroads. You can use still steel to build skyscrapers. Steel is going to revolutionize a lot of these industries, not only in terms of the physical infrastructure, but it will also allow for more complex metalworking. We will start to see especially the use of steel in military technology. We're also going to see a industry formed around chemicals, industrial chemicals. We have the creation of synthetics. We'll first pay attention to synthetics and petroleum. Synthetics essentially inorganic material. They're primarily used in dyes, for example. We are going to see the emergence and the transition away from organic material to inorganic material as a result of the creation of synthetics. We'll also see a new fuel source with petroleum. Petroleum, of course, will be instrumental in fueling the second industrial revolution. Oil or petroleum will be used especially in the creation of automobiles. So petroleum, a new fuel source for the world and a new major industry to boot. But we also have something known as dynamite or dynamite, as you Americans say. Dynamite is going to initially have a economic purpose, primarily for the building of railroads. Say there's a mountain you don't like, let's blow it up. We all have played Minecraft before. TNT, that's dynamite. However, dynamite is also going to have a military effect as well. Of course, as you can imagine, something that blows up could have a military potential, and that is definitely the case by the end of the 19th century. It's a little funny, the man who created dynamite, a dude by the name of Alfred Nobel, he's actually the one who will coin the Nobel Peace Prize. A little irony there. Well, it's intentional irony in many ways. Nobel really wanted uh, a way to end war. So he wanted to create something that would be so terrible, no one in their right mind would ever go to war with anybody. How well did that work out? Well, that's not for me to judge. Well, actually it is. Yes, that did not work out. Another major industry is electricity. Electricity is going to become a way of powering these industrial cities. And yet electricity is beyond the simple notion of power production. Electricity will be utilized in the creation of small time consumer products. So we start to see the invention of things like the motion picture uh, projector, the motion picture camera, I should say. We start to see the phonograph using electricity, the light bulb, of course. So electricity is making a consumer market for goods produced with machines. But on top of that, we're seeing more consumer goods because of the assembly line. And this is going to be notably coined by everyone's favorite anti-Semite, Henry Ford. Henry Ford is going to introduce the assembly line process to the creation of automobiles. So the assembly line will be instrumental in driving down costs and thus allowing more of a market for goods like the automobile. And overall, the 19th century is going to see an explosion of new ways of transportation, of railroads, of trains, of choo-choos, as I like to call them. We have steamships, the toot-toots, we have steamships we have, which have a transportation benefit. And we also can send communications in a matter of seconds with telegraphs and later telephones. So we are seeing the development of new ways of communication and transportation, stuff we've talked about before in last unit. 
But what are the results of these new technologies? Because we'll look at the philosophical implications and we're also gonna look at the economic implications. Well, for one thing, we've got new industries. We've got new places for people to work, new employment opportunities, you could say. But we're also seeing the rise of a new class in industrial societies. We are seeing the rise of the billionaire class of these major monopolists who own an entire industry. And these monopolists especially are gonna corner the market in industries like petroleum and chemicals and steel. In terms of steel, we have Andrew Carnegie. In terms of railroads, we have guys like Cornelius Vanderbilt. But more importantly for us in an international sense is the development of the petroleum industry. We have new billionaires like William Knox de Arcy from Great Britain, this terrible bald looking guy. He's going to found what will become Petro British Petroleum, BP. Hopefully they never spill any oil in the Gulf of Mexico. We also have John D. Rockefeller in the United States. He's going to found Standard Oil, which will eventually dissolve into ExxonMobil. So Rockefeller and de Arcy are both examples of a new type of businessman, the industrialist. And really, the notion of a billionaire is kind of radical. We've never had one before up until the end of the 19th century. Sure, we've had kings like Mansa Musa who were billionaires, I guess. But under capitalism, this is the first time where we start to see truly exponential amounts of wealth, of billions and billions of dollars. New technology is also going to have the impact of developing world trade, or at least encouraging its further growth, you should say. World trade is going to double by the end of the 19th century, the end of the 1800s, especially up until World War I. We are going to see an explosion of trade as a result of new technologies like railroads, like steamships. Basically, you can get to anywhere in the world in a matter of days, in a matter of weeks. Anyone watching around the world in 80 days right now? Oh, no, I've dated myself. Dang it. Well, around the world in 80 days, that's timeless. But the, the you can get anywhere, basically, is what I'm trying to say. And as you might imagine, if everywhere is connected from railroads and steamships, then no part of the world is not a part of the global economy. We have a truly international market. That's our third major result of new technology. And as such, business is done across national borders. So that's gonna have the impact of creating a truly global economy. The downside of this, however, is that when there's an economic downturn somewhere, say in the United States, this will have an adverse impact on the rest of the world. So we will start to see international depressions. We'll see 1893, there will be a panic, a depression. In 1906, there will be a depression. In 1929, there will be a depression. And you could even call this depression a sort of Great Depression, but it is the Great Depression. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Of. So we are seeing an international market with shared economic risks. But another major thing we're seeing is this very close relationship between government and research. Governments are going to sponsor research into economic fields like oil production, chemical production. And this has the overall, uh, this is the overall result of nationalism, of competing with other parts of Europe. There's also a military application of all of this. How do we stay not only economically competitive, but militarily competitive? 
So we will see heavy government investment in research like the military. We'll see, especially in places like Germany, a close relationship between the military and the chemicals industry. This will be important when we talk about the end, or excuse me, the World War, the First World War. Then we have some nerds talking about stuff as it relates to science. The growth of technological advances by the end of the 19th century is going to lead to an overall feeling of optimism in the intellectual circles of Western society. Gee, oh my, we have advanced so far technologically. We could use this technology to solve issues in our modern day society. That's basically what optimism or positivism is all about. And yet there's a dark side to all of this. And let me explain. But first things first, let's go back to the legacy of the scientific revolution way back in the 1600s. So the progress and intellectual curiosity of the late 19th century is a continuation of the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. And yet, we are seeing the replacement of traditional explanations for the natural world. Religion no longer dominates intellectual discourse as it relates to the natural world. That's a major change. Instead, it's based off of cold, rational science. Say what you will about religion, it has a code of ethics. But we've gotten rid of religion. God is dead, according to Friedrich Nietzsche. So what will restrain progress? So it goes to these ideas of pragmatism and moral relativism. Pragmatism, essentially, the end justifies the mean. The end or the results justifies how you get there. If you want to create a perfect society, it doesn't matter who's lost along the way. And this lack, or at least a shifting idea of moral absolutes is known as moral relativism. The idea that morality is subjective and that there are no restraints on this morality. This is gonna have very nasty implications as it relates to science and progress. And we're gonna see that especially in the field of eugenics. Eugenics is a pseudoscience, it's fake, but it is a understanding of the world in very rational and you could almost say scientifically progressive views. Eugenics is this idea that you want a perfect society free of genetic disorders free of undesirable genetic traits, quote unquote. But if we have pragmatism and moral relativism, it doesn't matter how you get to that perfect society. So a lot of eugenicists are in support of things like sterilization of people with genetic disorders and disabilities. So eugenics is saying to this idea of the end justifies the means, that the means, as inhumane as they are, are justified by a society free of genetic traits considered undesirable. Very similarly, we've talked about this idea of social Darwinism. This is the idea that human nature is inherently competitive that there is a limited amount of resources and we must struggle with each other. And the people who have the materials in society, the wealthy, they're clearly the fittest of this intense competition. The idea of the survival of the fittest, very much the notion of social Darwinism. Both eugenics and social Darwinism have both a class 
implication, meaning that there are undesirable genetic traits that make someone poor and make someone rich. And there are undesirable traits as it relates to race. Looking ahead to unit seven, we'll talk about how Nazism will utilize these ideas of endless technological and scientific progress for terrible, terrible results. That's looking us ahead to next unit. But who's actually leading this charge into scientific inquiry? Who will be debated about? Who will be discussed among intellectual circles? Well, first we got Charles Darwin and the years I have up here there when they were most active. Darwin, of course, is going to put to words the theory of evolution. Evolution is gonna have the impact of challenging religious explanations for the universe. The universe wasn't created in seven days. It was created, according to Darwin, over millions and millions of slow and agonizing years of evolution. Darwin reversed the first words of the church. In the beginning, I don't remember the, less, the rest. That's um, how many years of Catholic school? Anyway. Darwin is providing a naturalist explanation to how we got here. And his ideas are gonna be misinterpreted as social Darwinism. And I talked about that earlier. It's important to note Darwin has nothing to do with social Darwinism. But then in terms of technology, we have guys like Thomas Edison. Edison, you all know him, light bulb dude. Well, that's, never mind. But what's important about Edison is his commodification of electricity. He is going to mass produce a lot of consumable goods by everyday people or people who have money. So Thomas Edison is expanding who uses these new technologies. Then we got guys like Albert Einstein. Einstein is going to develop a theory known as the theory of relativity. Basically, he is challenging the Newtonian model of the universe. And he's saying that there's no absolute in time or space. Einstein is going to be misconstrued towards this idea of moral relativism. If there are no absolutes in science, that means logically that there are no absolutes in ethics. Einstein has nothing to do with this. It's a misinterpretation of scientific inquiry. And speaking of a misinterpretation of scientific inquiry, we have Sigmund Freud. Freud, I'm sure if you take any psychology class, you'll learn that nobody likes him anymore. He is absolutely detested among the modern psychological field. He did a lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, a questionable things, a lot of questionable things. But even though he is gonna say a lot of wrong things as it relates to psychology, he is going to put to words these intangible thoughts of things like mental health and introduce them to a wider public discourse. That's what Freud and why he's important. He's opening the doors for explorations of the intangible world, of the mental health world. Now let's look at philosophy real quick, because most of these philosophies will be in reaction to the Enlightenment and to the Industrial Revolution. We got romanticism. The word for romanticism is emotion. 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 Individualism. Passion. Striving for something to find meaning for one's self. So romanticism is very much against the cold, hard science of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. It's putting a human face on the world. How do we understand the world? How do we understand human beings? It's through spiritual and transcendental ideas. 
Transcendentalism essentially is, it's very popular in the United States actually, but it's this philosophy that in order to find inner meaning, we have to transcend beyond this physical realm, beyond where we are right now. And where we are right now to the transcendentalist is a state of industry. So transcendentalists very big on literally going into nature and chilling there. Another major movement in philosophy is realism. Realism is basically the opposite of romanticism. It is very much the continuation, you could say, of the enlightenment. Realism is all about how do we understand the human condition in material terms? How do we understand the material conditions of humanity through things like private property? And if this sounds familiar, it's because we've talked about this before with Karl Marx and socialism. Materialism, a movement Marx is a part of, tries to explain the world in very concrete material terms, the acquisition of private property in the case of Mr. Marx, Herr Marx. But then we also have a reaction against all of this technological progress with pessimism. Pessimism is essentially, well, it's the opposite of optimism. It's the idea that we have progressed so rapidly without a concern for the ethical well-being of the world as we know it. Pessimists are very concerned with the lack of fixed morality. They include groups like nihilists. Nihilists basically say that there's no meaning with life. Everything's, you know, there's no meaning to anything. Inherently, there's no meaning. Religion doesn't exist anymore. God is dead. We killed him. That's what Friedrich Nietzsche is saying. But these nihilists are also asking individuals to find their own meaning. The world is pointless, sure. It's our duty to find a point to it. And even though that sounds all wonderful and good, Nietzsche, well, huh, he's a cranky old guy. Anyway, let's continue. So consider some of the technologies. What are some of them? Consider what are the impacts economically of these new technologies? And then what's going on in terms of nerd stuff intellectually? The majority of this lesson is actually supposed to be about social changes. Actually, I didn't say any of that. The majority of your lesson objective, I should say, is mostly about social changes. So we'll look a gander at gender, we'll take a gander at immigration, and just general population increase. Well, let's first look at population changes. Well, we got increased population by 1914 dramatically fall as a result of a certain war that starts. But anyway, we have a whole bunch of people. It all goes back to that classic formula in world history. More food equals more people equals population increase. So the end of the 19th century is going to see an explosion of food production. We are going to see this food production rise as a result of these three things right here, of improved trade, of improved agricultural technology, and because of a diversity of diets. So let's talk about trade real quick. Well, basically we got steamships, we got railroads, we got international markets, baby. So we can ship food from one place and sell it to another place. We're gonna see the instances of famine decrease drastically as a result of industrialization. And the reason why we see more trade is because of new technologies like the railroad, like the steamship. But food is also lasting longer. We can transport meat whenever, wherever we want. We have refrigerators, we have canning. We can put it in a can and seal it from the rest of the world, like a little, like a little vault. 
We also have improved agricultural technology. We have new ways to get a lot of food. We have tractors. We have more machines in agricultural production. And that is going to lead to an increase of food. But the Industrial Revolution is also creating the wage economy. People have money to buy whatever they want, and there are markets that sell whatever. So it's no longer simply a diet based on bread or meat and potatoes. You can have a variety in your diet, leading to longer life expectancies, leading to more dang people. And we're also seeing population increase in places like the Americas and Oceania as a result of immigration. And we'll talk about that more today, actually. So consider before I move on to the next, society, next slide, what are some reasons why someone would move to a new country? Because that's what we're gonna talk about. What are those reasons why someone moves away or to a country? These are called push and pull factors. You've talked about this in your human geo class. Essentially, we are gonna see a increase in immigration by the end of the 19th century. We will see them primarily for push and pull reasons. So these are all kind of very general terms in terms of pushing and pulling. But we're gonna take a gander at specific instances that will influence immigration. That's what you should be focusing on. So we have political instability. And that is going to be a major reason why we see changes and trends towards immigration. So if there are, say, periods of revolution or war, like in Europe during the 1848 revolution, we're gonna see refugees, essentially, fleeing violence and going somewhere new. We'll see that with the Taiping Rebellion. We'll see that with Chinese immigrants fleeing violence and going to the United States. For example, the United States, prime example of an immigrant country. There's also religious persecution that's pushing people away. We'll see this especially with Jews in Eastern Europe. Those pogroms and instances of anti-Semitism, that's gonna lead to Jewish migration to the United States, for example. We'll also see Christian and Christian ethnicities in the Ottoman Empire fleeing persecution and going to Christian places, to Western Europe, to the Americas. But another major reason why people would leave a country is economic downturn. They want jobs somewhere else. So when there are depressions back in Europe, for instance, during the uh, late 19th century, they'll go to the place with the jobs, the United States. There are also famines that will push people out of their home country living in somewhere else. We have the Irish potato famine in the 1840s. And as you can imagine, there are also reasons why someone would move to a specific place. And we'll look using examples from the Americas, using examples from Oceania, Australia. So the allure of political stability and certain religious and ethnic freedoms are driving people to live in new places. So the United States has religious freedom, awesome. If you are a Jew or a Christian from the Ottoman Empire, guess where you're going? You're going to the US of A, baby. But there's also this idea of economic opportunity. The Americas is going to start industrializing by the end of the 19th century. The United States is already, but the rest of the Americas, places like Latin America, they need workers. They can't use slaves anymore, boo-hoo. So now they have to use the next best thing, cheap immigrant workers. So economic development is encouraging increased migration for economic reasons. But there's also the allure of land, especially in the United States, Australia, and Argentina. The Wild West of the United States, prime land for property ownership. 
the Patagonia region of Argentina in the South, prime land for real estate. To them, it's free real estate. And in the United States' case, it was actually free for a bit. That was the Homestead Act. And in Australia, we have the Outback, Outback Steakhouse, Bloomin' Onions. Of course, all of these people are going to run up against Native Americans and indigenous people in the case of Australia. But the pull factor of land ownership is a major reason why immigrants will go to places that have wide amounts of land open for settlement. And the 18th, or excuse me, the 19th century is also going to see an explosion of industrial cities. We are going to see mega lapas, mega, 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 megapolises in places around the industrial world. We've got Europe, we've got the United States, we've got Japan. Very similar developments to what we saw during the first industrial revolution. So we are gonna see the building of huge industrial cities. This graph right here represents the increase of industrial cities by the end of the 20th, or excuse me, the start of the 20th century. Massive population increase. We'll see that in places like the Ruhr Valley in Germany and sit with cities like Cologne and Essen. We'll see New York City, a major center of industry, but also immigration. And we'll talk about this more next unit, but we will see industrialization in Japan as well, leading to the massive city of Tokyo. And the problems of initial industrialization, of this initial urbanization way back in unit five, they're still going to be around. These problems of creating industrial cities, they're still going to be overcrowding, there's still going to be sanitation concerns, there's still pollution. And yet we are seeing attempts to address and plan out these cities. We'll start to see the invention of a grid system to rationally and sustainably increase a city's population and territory. But increasingly, we're not seeing a movement outward, but a movement upward. We start to see skyscrapers to accommodate all these new people. So we are gonna see improvements in city planning, the invention of a grid system, wider streets for automobiles when they come around. We'll see public transit and railroads in cities. Basically, we are seeing the invention of urban planning to accommodate massive and rapid industrialization and urbanization. And yet those problems of poverty still remain. On the surface, we're having these technological advances. We're building museums and parks. And yet underneath that surface, still the intense problems of poverty, of racial discrimination, a seemingly overall feeling of pessimism amidst a glitter of optimism. So that was dark, but let's look at gender, which is also a little dark. So we call this period of European history the Victorian era. And why is that? Well, in England, there's a lady, I almost said a dude. There's the queen, her name is Victoria. Victoria is gonna rule like a long time, from the 1830s to the 1900s. And during her rule, we're gonna see the development of middle-class ideas of gender. So the middle-class is largely permeating its moral values through society, not only in terms of politics, but in terms of social ideas. And oftentimes, as we'll see, they go hand in hand. So the Victorian era is a time of redefining social and ethical concerns for the family. And it's not just going to be Great Britain. It's going to be in the United States, in Western Europe, in Japan. And the thing we most commonly associate with the Victorian era, sorry, my leg is asleep, 
is ideas of gender hierarchy. We start to see these middle class ideas of gender hierarchy emerge. Basically, what expectations exist for a working class woman? Well, for a middle class woman first. Well, women can be one of two things, not a mom or a mom. Motherhood is stressed among Victorian era women, especially in the middle class. There's this idea of a absolute necessity to have a female presence in the home. And to maintain a stable home environment, we need women to have strict moral standards. They can't be running around sleeping with their neighbor. They should only have one partner, actually, and that should be their husband. So very strict moral standards for women during this Victorian era. We're also seeing restrictions on jobs as well for unmarried middle-class women. Sure, they can work, but it's going to be in fields that are largely going to be dominated by one gender over another. We'll see secretaries initially dominated by women. We'll see nurses, assistant basically to doctors, mostly filled by women. So there still is a man in charge. And there are economic opportunities, but it's mostly restricted to jobs deemed acceptable for women. And this idea of unmarried women being allowed to have jobs won't carry it over to married women. Married women are expected to stay in the domestic sphere, the domestic home life, raising the kids, reading fancy, fancy magazines. And then there's the public sphere, where the man does all the work, where the husband, the father, the, uh, I almost said wife, where the husband and father do all the business. So this idea of separate spheres defines middle-class ideas of womanhood. The domestic sphere is the area where the woman dominates, where the wife dominates. The public sphere is where the man makes the money to support the family. So the notion of domestic spheres is mostly applied to traditionalist and conservative members of the middle class. And yet among more radical members of the middle class, we are seeing the emergence of a social uh, movement for female political equality. So we are gonna see this idea of first wave feminism the notion that there is, um, excuse me, the notion that in order for there to be social equality, we need political equality. So we are going to see the emergence of first wave feminism, mostly as it relates to the suffrage movement. Remember, suffrage, the right to vote. However, much of the suffrage movement, much of this third, excuse me, first wave of feminism mostly concerned with the working class, or the opposite, mostly concerned with the middle class, with white members of the middle class. So the suffrage movement is an example of how these notions of gender hierarchy are being challenged indeed. Well, let's now look at working class women. Well, there is gonna be a shift away from the use of female workers, towards their absence in factories. And let's look at that process. Well, until the end of the 19th century, women largely worked in fields like domestic servitude. They would be the servant, the caretaker for a wealthy family. Unmarried women were also instrumental in the building of the textile industry. So we are going to see women especially involved in the textile industry by the start of the Industrial Revolution. And yet, we are going to see a gradual decline in female participation in factories. And mostly this is going to be the result of political action taken by this middle class. So in order to promote middle class values of a husband, going into the public sphere and a woman staying in the private sphere, we're gonna see a lot of restrictions on female employment. These restrictions 
are intended to protect women, quote unquote. They are intended to keep women out of factories with the implication of keeping them in the home. So middle class values of of hierarchy and patriarchy are making their way into reform movements to remove women from factories. So in terms of some legislation, we have the Mines Act saying, hey, women, you can't work in a factory anymore. You can't work in a mine anymore. This is done for your own good. Women are weak-willed after all. They cave under immense pressure and they cave in during cave-ins. Of course, I don't believe that. Well, I believe that cave-ins are a thing, but no. Anyway, so women are largely going to be absent from the industrial workforce as a result of these middle-class values being put into legal systems. Let's wrap up today by looking at fancy schmancy art. We'll first look at literature, then painting. Well, it goes back to those philosophical trends I talked about earlier. In terms of romantic literature, mostly by the start of the 1800s, we have a focus on horror, of human emotion. And horror is the deepest expression of human emotion. So we'll see that in works like Frankenstein, Frankenstein, eh, to quote Mel Brooks. We'll also see the novel, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, this idea of emotion and horror making their way into literature, making their way downtown, walk in fast, no. So we have examples like Frankenstein, which is also very much a reaction against science and the enlightenment. Then we got realism. Basically, let's depict society as realistically as possible. Let's especially focus on the concerns of working class people. So we'll see that in works like The Jungle about the conditions in factories. We'll see that in Oliver Twist about the conditions of poverty in London. Then we have a new movement, particularly by the end of the 19th century, the start of the 20th century, and that is modernism. Modernism essentially says, screw you, tradition. I'm going to do my own thing. Screw you, grammar. Screw you, negative. I'm going to disregard all of those things. So modern, modernism is the breakdown of tradition in literature, of things like narrative and grammar. There's, the, there's a dude, his name is E.E. E. Cummings. All of his letters are lowercase. He doesn't punctuate. He is saying, screw you to conventional grammar as a reflection of this idea of no scientific or moral absolutes. We'll also see that idea of pessimism in T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which we'll actually uh, potentially read a snippet of it next unit. So then let's look at some pretty paintings. We got some pretty paintings. We got paintings mostly to do with themes of emotion, of inner self-reflection. We have ideas of horror and emotion. We have this example right here, the fall of Pompeii. Using the example of Pompeii, you can see emotion in the faces, the fear. We see this idea of nature, especially in paintings like this one up here, very pretty. We'll see that in the paintings right here. This is one of my favorite paintings by um, David Caspar Friedrich. But we also see this idea of nationalism, of striving for something for the good of the people in Romanticism. That's why we'll see works like Liberty Leading the People, Liberty an Embodiment of the National Identity of France. And this right here is actually also an example of nationalism. And let me explain. It is a scene from Norway. It is a scene to depict the glory and splendor of Norway's nature. That's what's going on there. Then we got realism. Realism is amazing in terms of its skill. Look how well it depicts the natural world. 
the environment, the working conditions of everyday yokels like you and me. So realism depicts life at its most realistic, in the factory, on the farm, in the stone fields. So realism is very much focused on what it means to be a part of the working class. And as you can imagine, it's going to end because there's a new way to depict life as realistically as possible with far less painting required. And that is, of course, photography. But then we also have developments in terms of modernism and art. We have impressionism and expressionism, impressionism, essentially, what can you glean from a superficial look at something? What information can you acquire? Essentially, what's helpful about impressionism to understand it, what would you see if you blurred your eyes? You would see something like this. You would see something like this down here. So less concrete subject matter in impressionism. Expressionism is more kind of applying those ideas of glancing a gaze, but also of using art to depict inner turmoil, of inner struggles with, for, for example, mental health. So expressionism is expressing mental concerns especially with someone like Vincent van Gogh. This is a painting by van Gogh. This is the wheat field. It's going to be a symbol of that passing glance. But as you can see with these dark areas, it's more of a concern for Vincent's mental health, an expression of the turmoil in his brain. But then we're going to have movements that say, screw you all together, conventional art. I'm just going to paint whatever I want. We see the development of cubism, very much abstract art, a breakdown of artistic tradition. We're breaking down what is considered beautiful, what's considered not beautiful. It's a breakdown of what art is supposed to be. It can be whatever the heck you want. And our first major movement in abstract art is cubism. We have guys and gals like Picasso, who painted this painting right here. Picasso painted this portrait right here. That's a woman. That's a hat right there. That's her hair. That's her mouth. Confusing, confusing picture. That's all I have for today. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. I hope you enjoyed the art section. I certainly did. Let me know if you have any questions, obviously, and um, hit that um, dang like and subscribe. You know, they always say hit that like and subscribe button, but haven't YouTubers ever kind of calmly asked for you to click on that softly? I don't know, man. Well, that's something for a future philosopher to figure out. Thank you very much for your time. I am signing off. Doo -doo 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 -doo.